All right, so because I'm wearing this, uh, first and foremost, uh, these are my own personal opinions. Uh, they do not represent those of the RMA, the Department of Defense, or the federal government. Uh, so when we're talking about sex differences, um, bottom line up front, sex differences are apparent and they are pervasive. Uh, sexual differentiation during embryonic development begins right away. Um, and we definitely see sex differences across puberty and through adulthood. So given these two truths, um, it makes perfect sense that we see sex differences at a systems level, um, at the level of genes, brains, and behavior. Uh, so that being said, I am going to focus specifically on the sleep-wake system today. Uh, this is some work that I was able to do during my postdoc in Atlanta. And a lot of what we know about sex differences in sleep uh, comes from the early work of my postdoc mentor, Dr. Katema Paul. And so what uh, Dr. Paul found many years ago is that if you look at spontaneous sleep amounts in mice, that you see very clear sex, sex differences. Um, first, mice are nocturnal. Um, and they also, we say they have spontaneous sleep because they don't have consolidated sleep periods like we see in humans. Uh, but if you happen to look at spontaneous sleep amounts using electrophysiology in mice that have intact gonads, you see very clear sex differences where female mice have significantly less sleep than male mice. Now, this is specific to the dark phase. Again, even though mice are nocturnal, they do have spontaneous sleep amounts. So you do see biphasic sleep with sleep being shown during the dark phase. But what was really interesting about the early days of this work is that as soon as these mice were gonadectomized during adulthood, all these sex differences were masked. Um, and so it really pointed to the first key piece of evidence that there is an impact of sex steroids on sleep and wake processes. Now, as we heard from uh, Dr. Sterrett's presentation, uh, sex differences are extremely complicated and it's more than just sex steroids. We also have to factor in genetic sex. Um, and so this is one thing that I spent most of my postdoc doing where we were manipulating genetic sex through transgenic mouse lines in order to further elucidate these differences. Now, the classic model in terms of how the testes determining gene, SRY, impacts sex differences, it's fairly straightforward. So in the presence of the SRY gene, there is normal phenotypic male development where you have the presence of testes. Um, if the embryo does not contain the SRY gene, then the embryo develops into a phenotypic female um, and develops ovaries. So taking this basic 20th century model, uh, we were able to use a, a, a mouse line that was developed by Dr. Art Arnold at UCLA, where you can have spontaneous deletion of the SRY gene and create really four unique scenarios that allow for complete uh, separation of gonadal sex versus chromosomal sex. So what's really unique about this mouse model, it's called the four core genotype line, is that you can create four different scenarios. And two scenarios that are really unique is you can create XY mice that are lacking in SRY, which means they develop into phenotypic females. And then you can create mice that are XX, but containing SRY. So they develop into phenotypic males. And so we were able to leverage this four core genotype model to then again, look at sleep and wake states using electrophysiology. And then we also characterize some of the underlying neural substrates. Okay, so first and foremost, uh, when we looked at spontaneous sleep amounts across 24 hour periods, uh, we first focus our attention on mice with intact gonads um, to truly see what impact phenotypic sex had on sleep and wake behavior. So what you're seeing right here are three different states of sleep. You have total sleep across a 24 hour period, and then you have the division of total sleep into 
the two core sleep processes, which are non-rapid eye movement sleep and rapid eye movement sleep shown on the bottom. We also separated out sleep between the light and dark phase because again, mice do not have consolidated sleep periods. They sleep during both phases. And one of the key findings we found, very similar to what my postdoc mentor found in the early days, is that the phenotypic female mice were sleeping significantly less during the dark phase. So we wanted to see, again, this is in mice that had intact gonads. Um, so of course we wanted to look if this impact persisted in the absence of gonads. And so we did the same exact experiment, this time following a gonadectomy. And yet again, we found the same exact results. So what you see here on the left is the breakdown based on genetic sex. There are absolutely no differences between the genetic males and the genetic females, either during the light phase or the dark phase. And, but what you do see is if you break it down by phenotypic sex, again, you see this difference where females are sleeping significantly less during the dark phase compared to the phenotypic males. So this more or less shows that the SRY gene is necessary and sufficient to explain sex differences in sleep and wake processes. Now, of course, we kind of wanted to look at this under some more real world conditions. Um, sleep deprivation is evident. Uh, of course, you know, I'm in a career path where sleep deprivation is sometimes a, a winning prize, if you will. Um, so uh, we wanted to see if these differences could persist if the sleep system was homeostatically challenged. Um, and, to start, and to our surprise, many of these sex differences disappeared in the presence of sleep deprivation. But in one mouse line where we continue to see these phenotypic female sex differences are in the true females that are XX and lacking SRY. Okay, so of course, um, sleep, it's more than just electrophysiology. Uh, sleep is a whole brain process. There are a, a significant amount of brain areas that regulate sleep at the level of the cortex and then subcortical areas such as the hypothalamus. Um, and so it's really important to us to take a mechanistic understanding of our sleep results. And so we did this using immunohistochemistry. Um, one of the, the easiest shotgun approaches to look at differences in neuronal activity in different brain areas is to do uh, an immunohistochemical stain of the biomarker uh, CFOS. And so that's exactly what we did, where we basically looked at various brain areas, specifically within the hypothalamus, that regulate sleep and wake states. Now, you know, all of us as scientists, sometimes you have that experiment where, you know, you're a postdoc or a graduate student, and you have that one study that years later, you tell your grad students and your postdoc, like, well, back in my day, I did this. So this for me was, was my study because uh, if you remember the results I showed you, we found that there were spontaneous uh, sleep differences during the dark phase. Um, and so in order to truly capture what neuronal activation was like in these areas of the hypothalamus during the dark phase, it basically meant that I had to sit in the dark with a red light because uh, mammalian species are insensitive to red light and sit there for hours until I watch these mice fall asleep uh, using some of the behavioral criteria for sleep and then to sacrifice them um, and to uh, stain their brains for this biomarker. So to my luck, it only took about four hours of uh, sitting in the dark on multiple occasions for this to happen. Uh, but th this whole process was worth it because we did find very clear differences in a variety of hypothalamic areas of the brain. Um, and this is just one of the representative brain areas here. Uh, what you see here is a coronal section under um, a microscope of the suprachiasmatic nucleus, uh, which is the essential hypothalamic area responsible for generating and maintaining circadian rhythms. Um, you can see here that there are very clear differences in the amount of neuronal activation between males and females, where females have more activation compared to males, 
um, which does lend credence to this idea of having less sleep during the dark phase, as I had shown previously. Now, what's interesting is that those differences, I should mention, disappeared under sleep deprivation. So it was very similar to what we saw under the instances of looking at sleep using electrophysiology, um, that sleep deprivation does indeed mask sex differences in sleep and wake processes. Now, of course, it would be remiss if we didn't take a bench to bedside approach um, and look at some translational studies in humans. Um, so I did my postdoc at the Morehouse School of Medicine, which is a historically black college and university. So a lot of our research is geared towards understanding uh, disease states that pr primarily affect African-Americans. Um, and so this is exactly what we did in this study. We specifically recruited African-Americans uh, largely from low-income areas around Atlanta. And we looked at various uh, uh, sex disparities and uh, disordered sleep um, and whether or not sex had a, a significant impact on the severity of sleep apnea. So um, one thing I will mention about our population is they were significantly overweight. Um, they were, uh, their BMI was, uh, you know, fits the criteria for morbidly obese. Um, so that was, that is one thing to consider because it means that there is a great statistical likelihood that these individuals have sleep apnea. Uh, there's direct relationships between um, overall BMI and the severity of sleep apnea. And you can truly see this in this population here. Um, so up top, those are the, um, the overnight sleep study readouts for uh, the males. And on the bottom, those are the overnight sleep study readouts for the females. Um, two things that are worth mentioning. First and foremost, the severity of sleep apnea was significantly worse in the males uh, compared to the females. Uh, what's interesting is typically with sleep apnea, um, you see these hypoxic episodes during the transition from non-REM to REM sleep. Uh, so most people who have severe sleep apnea report very low REM sleep amounts. But what's interesting about this population of males is that they also had a significant amount of hypoxic episodes during non-REM sleep itself, which truly lends credence to that um, there are apparent sex differences in insufficient sleep because you see a lack of respiration, not just during REM sleep, but also non-REM sleep. Um, what's interesting about this study is, you know, since this time I've gone on and I've done uh, clinical research for the military, um, and we actually, quite honestly, see reverse in military populations. Um, some of the recent work that has been done by my colleagues at Walter Reed, we find that females actually have a higher rate of sleep disorders, um, particularly sleep apnea compared to males. Um, so it does vary by demographic and it does seem to vary by population. Uh, so this is all I have for you today. Um, I hope by the end of this, I have convinced you that there are very clear sex differences in sleep. Uh, these are apparent, not just at the level of how genetics can drive these differences, but also at the level of uh, brain and behavior, specifically with uh, differences most appearing in the hypothalamus. And then lastly, uh, we do see direct translation of this work in human populations, uh, specifically if you look at the severity of sleep apnea. Uh, so that being said, um, I of course would like to thank um, the institutes at the National Institutes of Health who have funded my work over the years. And then of course, my wonderful mentors at UCLA, Morehouse School of Medicine and Northwestern um, who have helped me do this research and, and most of the research in my career. So thank you.